in the last video, we discussed the fact that if I have a 2 by 2 determinant, I can view that as being made out of two vectors, either the two vectors that make up its rows, as I've written right here, or the two vectors that make up its columns. Either way, if I use those vectors to form a parallelogram, the area of that parallelogram will be the absolute value of the determinant of that matrix. Okay. You'll notice that what I put inside these vertical bars is not A, then the vertical bars would mean determinant. What I put inside is the determinant of A, which is a number. So now those bars do mean absolute value. All right, now if I have a three by three matrix, I can view this as being made up of three vectors in three space. I could either think of it as being made up of the three rows. That's what I've done here. I said the vector A is the first row, with components A1, A2, and A3, B is the second row, and C is the third row. But I could also look at it as being made up of the three columns, where the first column would be A1, B1, C1. Doesn't matter. Either way, if I take those vectors and I put them so that their tails are together, I can view them as the three adjacent sides of something that looks like this. I've drawn a copy on the board. I've got a model of it here. This is like a skewed box, and we call it a parallel piped. I'll write that down. Parallel piped. <laughs> That's like a rectangular box, except, of, except instead of having rectangles as the sides, we've got parallelograms. All right, if I calculate the volume of that parallel pipe bed, it turns out that's going to be the absolute value of the determinant of this matrix. Now, I've just asserted this fact without proof, and I'm gonna leave it at that. We're not gonna prove this one. We will be able to, in a little bit, prove this fact, that the absolute value of the determinant will be the volume of that parallel pipe bed. And it works even in the degenerate cases. So for the two by two, if my vectors had been parallel, so if I had something like here was W1 and here was W2, well, they don't really form a parallelogram. They would call it, form what we call a degenerate parallelogram because they have zero height. The area would be zero. The determinant of that matrix would be zero. Same thing works here. If I end up with a degenerate parallel piped so that I don't have um, any volume because all three vectors lie in the same plane, well, then the determinant would be zero. Again, we'll eventually be able to prove that. Not ready to do that yet. Before we get there, we're going to need to define this thing called the cross product, which is the title of this section. Now, the cross product is kind of, sort of, a way of multiplying two vectors in three space. It's in three space only. If you ever find yourself taking the cross product of two vectors in two space, you are doing something wrong because that does not exist. So the cross product is in three space only. And here's how it works. If I have a vector V, which we'll say is V1, oh, you know what, let's just, let's pick a specific specific example instead. Let's say V was 1, 2, negative 4, and let's say W is 2, negative 3, 0. <laughs> I can define the cross product, which I will write as V crossed with W, as it's going to be a symbolic determinant. Now you'll notice I only have two vectors in three space. So I can't form a square matrix out of them, because if I put these into a matrix, it would be a two by three matrix. Well, what I'm gonna do is for my first row, I'm gonna put my unit vectors, I, J, and K. For my second row, I'm gonna put the first vector in this cross product. So I would put one, two, negative four. And for the third row, I'm gonna put the second factor in my cross product. So that would be 2, negative 3, 0. Now, I can't calculate the determinant of this because the determinant is a number and not all of these entries are numbers. But I can calculate what we call a symbolic determinant 
To do that, I'm going to have to expand on the first row. The first row is the special one, it's the weird one, it's the one that has vectors as its entries instead of numbers. So if I do that, I would say, okay, well my first entry is i, and what I'm supposed to do is multiply that by the 2 by 2 determinant that I get if I eliminate the row and the column that contain i. But that's just going to be a number. So what that's going to do is give me a scalar multiple of i, and that scalar will be the 2 by 2 determinant of this matrix, 2, negative 4, negative 3, 0. And then minus, I do the same thing with the next entry. I'm going to get j times an appropriate 2 by 2 determinant. I'm going to write that 2 by 2 determinant first, because we usually write scalars in front of vectors. I calculate that by eliminating the row and the column that contain j, so I'm left with 1, negative 4, 2, 0, plus I'm going to get some k's. And the scalar in front of k will just be the 2 by 2 determinant I get by eliminating the row and column containing k. So I'll have 1, 2, 2, negative 3. So let's see, this is 0 minus 12, so I have negative 12i, minus 0 minus a negative 8 is 0 plus 8, so that will be 8j, plus negative 3 minus 4 is going to become negative 7k. Now very often what I'll do, because I tend to prefer writing things in bracket notation, so this is negative 12, negative 8, negative 7, I can certainly get that after I've written it in terms of i, j, k. I will often go straight to the bracket notation. So I'll just say I'm going to get some i's. The number of i's is my first component. And I get that by calculating this 2 by 2 determinant. That's going to be nothing minus 12. That gives me a negative 12. Then I'm going to get some j's, but I'm subtracting them. So what I usually do is I say, okay, I'm working with this 2 by 2 determinant, but I'm going to be subtracting that number as my second component. Essentially, if I just calculate it backwards, if I do this diagonal minus that diagonal, that incorporates that negative sign. So I would say negative 8 minus 0, and that gives me my negative 8. And then for the k's, which will give me my third component, I'm doing this 2 by 2 determinant, but I'm not doing it backwards because I'm getting a positive copy of that as my scalar. So that's going to be negative 3 minus 4 gives me my negative 7. All right. Now, this is called the cross product. It is another vector in three space. I said this is kinda, sorta, like a way of multiplying vectors in three space to get another vector in three space. But that kinda, sorta is really important because I associate the term multiplication with certain properties. And the cross product does not have all of those properties as we will see as we work through this section. So I am not calling this vector multiplication, I am calling it the cross product. Two very important things, one, it only works in three space, two, it is not a full-on generalization of multiplication as we know and love it. Some things that are true of multiplication in the real numbers are not true of the cross product in three space. And we'll start working through what this means and why we might want to do it. It actually turns out to be very useful. But it's not at all obvious from the definition that this would be useful in any way, shape, or form. So we've got a lot of work ahead of us.